most people have signed up, but I'm sure there are probably some who have not. So, all right, let's go ahead and start our study here in Genesis chapter 35, and we'll open with a word of prayer. Uh, Lord and Father, we come to you this evening, and we just um, pray for this time that we have. We're just so thankful that we live in a country that we can open up your word and, and not worry about the fear of retribution. Pray for our leaders. We pray for our servicemen and women who um, safeguard some of these liberties that we have. And we pray that as citizens of this country, we take those liberties seriously and we would defend them. Father, pray for this study. Pray that uh, we would study your word and truth, that we would put pride aside and, and, and just elevate uh, the truth of Scripture. Uh, give us the discernment on how to do so. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, Genesis chapter 35. We went through the first three uh, verses last week. And uh, this is whenever uh, Jacob heads back heads back to Bethel. He had spent uh, a number of years apparently in Shechem. And if you remember right, uh, not last week, but the week before when we were in chapter 34, um, that is where Dinah was raped. And so Jacob ends up leaving. And uh, there's, there are ramifications like we talked about when it comes to both Simeon and Levi as a result of what they instigated um, in, in Shechem. And uh, we're going to see here in chapter 35 an event that's going to take place um, with Reuben, the oldest one, and it's going to have ramifications as well. And so we have to understand that there's a reason why a lot of these events are in here. They, they tell us answers to why the priests are Levites, why not Reubenites. You know, we get the answers from these, these studies. Um, why is it that, the, um, that Jesus had to come from, from Judah? Why not from Reuben? Well, Reuben was the oldest, right? Well, the answer to that question comes in this chapter here that we're going to hopefully get to this evening uh, in chapter 35 and, and chapter 36 as well. And so uh, that's the kind of stuff that's important. It almost seems like, well, it's not creation and it's not the beginning of the law. And, you know, Abraham's already gone. So this is kind of just filler, not important stuff. But this stuff here is very important when it comes to why things turned out the way that they did. And so here in chapter 35, Jacob have, has left. He's went to Bethel, and um, that's the place in which God appeared to him whenever he was fleeing from his brother Esau, and he was heading up to find, find a wife. Uh, Bethel was that place where Jacob's ladder took place, the vision that he had. It's the place where he made a vow to God, saying that if you indeed do these things for me, then you will be my God. And, I, um, and so he made a vow there. And God has told him um, in, in verse 1 of 35 to get himself over to Bethel and dwell there. So don't just go there, but I want you to go there and I want you to dwell there. And he's, he's going to end up not being there there for very long, it appears. So those are the things that have, have taken place. We looked in verse 2 of chapter 35 where Jacob um, tells his household uh, to put away the strange gods. We talked about the fact that those strange gods likely came from whenever they ransacked Shechem and they took all the goods of their houses. Uh, it's likely that they took their statues and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, maybe they didn't. We don't know for sure. But uh, uh, there's, there's only so many options where, where they have these strange gods. Now, we do know that, uh, that Rachel had some, some gods that she stole from her father Laban. And so in verse 2 here, he says, put them away. Um, and he tells them to be clean and change your garments, you know, because he understands as we're going up to meet God, as he's going to do that, um, that they need, to, they need to cleanse themselves. They're not just going over to see the neighbors. They're going, going to the house of God, and they're going to show themselves before, uh, before the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Uh, in verse 3, it says, and he says, let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way in which I went. And so he says here that he answered him in his distress. And that's the distress that took place in Genesis chapter 28, whenever he was fleeing from his brother. Uh, and and as, as, as we will look at 
um, briefly, probably, whenever we look at what happens with Reuben and how he loses the birthright because of his actions. Um, it's interesting whenever you consider the birthright situation when it comes to Jacob and Esau because um, Jacob made Esau sell him his birthright, right, for the member that for a, a, a bowl of porridge, right? Well, in a birthright was typically you got double the goods and you got the authority and the blessing, which he got the blessing, but there's no indication ever um, that Jacob ever got any of the goods from his father. In other words, the double inheritance, which, which, would, which would typically come from it. And so uh, it's just interesting um, how, um, how that took place. Uh, he got the birthright, but did he really get the whole birthright? It's pretty interesting whenever you look at all of that. Um, and, and we looked at, um, you know, how it talks about here and this idea of, of cleansing, uh, cleansing ourselves. And how do we apply that to ourselves? And how, does Israel, how did Israel have to apply that to themselves? Um, being clean to come before God is a truth. You know, you can't, you, you know, you need to be clean before you come before God. But that's the thing is in this day of grace, um, he makes us clean whenever we believe. We put on his righteousness according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. And so we put on his righteousness. Whereas in, in, the, in the days of Israel, they had to perform the law. The law was their righteousness and that type of thing. And so the idea of cleaning and all that type of stuff um, was, um, was a must. And it was what we're seeing here with Jacob was uh, set the stage for what's reinforced later as the Mosaic law is given, those types of things. And so um, just very, very interesting. And the other thing that I want to point out before we move on from verse 3 there is, do you remember what the name Bethel means? Say it louder. Because you were right. Say it louder because I knew you were right. I wouldn't put you on the spot if I thought you were wrong. Yeah, house of God. House of El. El being God. And so, um, you know, in, at the end of chapter 34, he talked about El Bethel. In other words, the God of the house of God. Well, what's interesting, though, is even when you study this situation of Bethel in the house of God, and you compare that to us today, you know, where's the house of God today? He's in us. Saints today are the house, but that wasn't always the case. As, as we see here, there was a time in which God, you know, had a tabernacle. He had a temple or he had a city which was his place in which you would go to for God. Whereas in today, look at 1 Corinthians 3. And again, this just shows um, the distinctiveness of progressive revelation and, and for what's the situation with the body of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Paul says, know you not, he's talking to believers, that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. And so, you know, at a different time, and you know, just because you were, you know, God's, because you were sanctified, meaning set aside for God's purpose, didn't mean you were, um, you were indwelled by God. You were the dwelling place of God. Here Jacob is going to the place which he sees as the place in which God um, came down at, came down to. And so, and you can look at chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. He says it again in verse 19. He says, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? And so again, we, we see that today we are the dwelling place of God. That wasn't the case back then. Um, look at Deuteronomy. As a matter of fact, look at Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. Again, we talked uh, in the Romans Sunday School about um, the confusion that some people have when it comes to the word saints and the idea that somehow saints was a new thing that started after Jesus was born or after Jesus died. 
um, and or it's only the church. Saints um, are, are is just a word for for something or someone. We looked at angels that were called saints. But here, look at Deuteronomy 33, verse 3. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy work words. And so again, understanding at that time in Jacob's day and age, uh, you could be um, set aside for God's purpose, but that doesn't mean that we can apply the things that are true for us to back then, nor can you apply the things that were back then automatically to us. This is why you have to study the scriptures and understand. And so here in Jacob's day, the idea of cleansing themselves and going up to see God um, um, was a was an important thing and under they they didn't have the same promises that we do today you know verse 4 Genesis chapter 35 so he basically tells them give you know let's clean ourselves up here verse 4 and they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hands so apparently they had uh, had some and all their earrings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the, under the oak, which was by Shechem. And so they give them over to him. Doesn't have, at least in Scripture, there's no indication of any arguments. But uh, if there was any bad feelings, I'm sure that got um, um, put down pretty quick. So, so they hand over their stuff, even their earrings. And it doesn't mean their earrings are bad, but... Um, you know, I would imagine these might have been earrings that were associated with, you know, either immodesty, immodesty or even um, the worship, because you had you had jewelry that was specifically in that day associated with the worship of other gods, and so um, could have been that kind of stuff as well. So, did you ever hear that? Okay. Verse five, and they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Now, this is interesting because um, remember whenever Simeon and Levi led the, the, um, the killing, the onslaught against them in Shechem, and then the other ten, ten sons went in and helped, um, you know, ransack and take all the goods. What was Jacob's response to this? Good. Yeah, and he basically said that you put a target on my back. You put a target on my back because of what you've done. And so he's afraid, and, and probably rightfully so to some degree, but understanding God had made promises to, to Jacob and nothing was going to happen to him. And, and again, not because he deserved it, but because God made the promise. And those are the kind of things that we have to understand and apply to ourselves, that it's not because we deserve the promises that God made to us, but it's because he made those promises to us that they are sure. And so nothing was going to happen to Jacob because that was part of the blessing that he, he received and the promise that, that was attached to him. But this idea of putting the fear of, you've heard that term, putting the fear of God in somebody. Well, I guess it means something when God puts the fear of God in somebody because that's, that's what's taking place here. And so it's not, the, it's not really the first time uh, that that's, that's taken place. Um, this happened during the Exodus. Look at Exodus chapter 23. We see God does the same thing for the people of Israel whenever they're fleeing. Exodus 23, verse 20, 24. Exodus 23, 24 says, Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them, talking about whenever they go into the promised land, um, and, and quite break down their images. A quick break down, quite break down their images. And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. I will send my fear before thee and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. What do you think that means? God's going to put the fear of God in them and they're going to flee. That's what he means by they're going to turn their backs to you because they're going to turn their backs and flee from you. 
There's, they're not going to mess with you because I'm going to cause them to fear. And this is what's happening with Jacob is the same idea. And so we see it with Jacob. We see it during the Exodus. Um, look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, start in verse 22. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 22. It says, For if you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you, to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all those nations from before you, and you shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours, from the wilderness in Lebanon, from the river and the river Euphrates, unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon. As he hath said unto you, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. And so, again, we see here this idea of this blessing and a curse, and they had the promise, and and God was going to drive the people out to secure, um, to secure the way for them. And Jacob has this situation. God has his back, and he's not going to let anything happen to him. Um, and so uh, that's another thing that we, um, uh, when we compare Israel, and when we compare the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the nation of Israel, and we see these curses in which um, God gives the nation of Israel. Do you recall anywhere in Paul's epistles, anywhere where you, you're a curse? No. Unless you're not saved. And when I say you, I mean those who are saved. So yet you're, you're right. But meaning those who are saved, there, there isn't. Boy, you guys are good. Yeah. Look at Galatians. There is a curse. There is a curse. There's really two curses <coughs> that, um, as it relates to the body of Christ, one, that Jesus Christ was made a curse for us. Um, he was made a curse for you, if you're saved. There is a curse that, that Paul talks about during this day of grace. And there's only one curse that's ever mentioned. Whereas in Israel, if you didn't follow the law and didn't follow, follow it exactly, you know, you could, you know, you could take your, 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 your animal for, for a sacrifice and get your sins forgiven, yes. But we saw more than once they were driven out in judgment because of the things that they did. But when it comes to the body of Christ, the only curse that we ever see is when Paul talks about it here in Galatians 1. Yeah, say it louder. That's right, Galatians 1, verse 8. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which, you have, than that which you have, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so I now say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. And so again, here in the body of Christ, the cursing is on, on those who... <laughs> Who, who come with another gospel. Um, you would expect those who, who are coming with another gospel aren't saved themselves. Um, but I, I can tell you this. Um, even if you are saved and you preach another gospel, because that's where the natural instinct of man wants to go, it's always the what ifs, you know, right? We always want to think about the what if situations. What happens if, if Pastor Don Hospital all of a sudden one day says, you know what, I think I was wrong, and I start preaching a works-based salvation. you got to be circumcised, you got to follow all Moses. Does that mean I'm accursed? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. No, you're not. Well, how can I be accursed? 
I can't be accursed because who would be cursed if I did? Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And once you're in Christ Jesus, you cannot be removed from Christ Jesus. The context here is talking about those who are not in Christ Jesus. Okay? So you can, so whenever you, whenever you try to, people want to come with these what about situations or whatever, and, and there's always this desire to try to find the one case in which Jesus' blood does not continually cover, in other words, you're not eternally saved. And this is one of the verses in which people want to look at, in the idea, is the idea. Do I think that there are going to be uh, answers that have to be given for the deeds done in this body? Yes. Do I think there's a judgment seat of Christ? Yes. A bema seat? Yes. Do I think the body of Christ goes through that situation? Yes. But do I think that there's any way a person who is in Christ could ever be taken out of Christ? No. no. And the context here is cursed meaning damned. Let that person be anathema. And so keep that in mind that whenever we think about the body of Christ, when we think about Israel, Israel, even though the nation had a sure promise, individual people in the nation of Israel were not guaranteed salvation, which is why you saw people in, 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 Israel's, in Israel's day that weren't going to be saved, even though the nation of Israel would, even though Paul says the fact that, that, that is, all of Israel will be saved, but we know that it, Scripture says not all of Israel is Israel. And so keep in mind that whenever we think of cursing and blessings the nation of Israel, that you could, you could be part of the nation of Israel and not be saved. But you cannot be part of the body of Christ and not be saved. Yes? Okay. What if... Uh, uh, just to play the advocate a little bit, sure. I've been faced with this question, is, um, okay, if, if we're just to believe, that's really all we need to do. Mm -hmm. What if we're believing somebody is, who is um, you know to, or if we believe in a false gospel because I, I, I've heard like the only way you can you don't actually lose your salvation like for people who have fallen away and shipwrecked and not ever coming back retro, reprobate that sort of thing they, um, they just never believed in the first place so where does the person that doesn't believe in the correct thing fit into it where does the supposed saint or and, and let me repeat that in case the volume of the congregation makes sense. So the question Derek is asking, what about those who didn't believe the right gospel? In, in a nutshell, that's what he's asking. And so in other words, you know, does that mean that they never believed? And here's one of the problems with, uh, you know, kind of a, a lordship salvation approach. I agree with John MacArthur on many things. I disagree with him on some very, very important things. Uh, John MacArthur, when it comes to this issue, matter of fact, I didn't read, read the article, but I heard um, that he came out with and said that he, he in some way doubts Ravi Zacharias was saved because of what Ravi Zacharias did. Why does he say that? Well, be, because the inclination is, is, well, if you're doing that, then you must have never believed. That's the idea. The problem is, is we're, 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 we're trying to answer for God where Scripture's already answered for it. Either you believe the right gospel or you didn't. You know, I can't, you know, I can't measure, you know, if you did or not. All I can do is tell you what the gospel is. Ephesians 1.13. There is no qualifying other than did you believe the gospel of your salvation, which means you could believe the wrong gospel. But just because somebody all of a sudden falls into sin, that doesn't mean that I'm going to say, well, they must have believed the wrong gospel. I don't think that that's fair. I don't think that it's right, and I don't think that's biblical. No, well, the, 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 is that they didn't, they didn't really believe in it. Yeah, so and, like, and I, think that's a good, you, I think that's a good cop-out. I think that's well, a good cop-out no, by no, some. But, you know, times when I've struggled and I've stumbled, okay, I ask myself, well, gee, if you really believed in that, you know, if you believed in God and, uh, you know, the consequences, et cetera, then I, would, I wouldn't have done that. See, I just don't think that's a biblical approach because right. Paul even talks about the things that I would do, I right. don't, and the things that I don't do, you know. And so he's talking about walking. He's talking about, he's talking to a bunch of people who are, most of Paul's writings are correcting believers who are doing it the wrong way. Think of it. Almost all of his writings are about that. So which of those are the ones who didn't really believe? And so that's the danger of going down that road. 
The question is, is do I understand what the true gospel is? The gospel of salvation is the death, burial, and resurrection for your sins. I'm not putting my faith in anything but the finished work of Christ for my sins. If that's the case, just because you mess up, I, I wouldn't encourage anybody to begin to question their own salvation. That's what Satan wants us to do. I, I think that what, what, what we need to do is realize that, well, wait a minute, I've been bought with a price, so I shouldn't be doing this. And that's Paul's technique. Paul never, ever tells people to question their salvation. He never suggests the idea, well, then you didn't believe. What he says is, well, wait a minute, you shouldn't be doing that because you, you're, you were once part of that group, and now you're not. And so I think that that's... Yeah. I, that, I guess it's not that a quite, it's evidentiary sort of, um, I don't know, not evidence, but your actions speak louder than words. I mean, you know, I'm, that's a cliche, but it does, I think, apply, I suppose. And, I, I think that, yeah, and I think, I think that we have to have common sense. Of that, the, you know, the flesh um, and, and the struggle that Paul talks about, and you're right, I mean, he has to go back and correct every Sure. Everybody except for the uh, Thessalonians, he's correcting. And so the way, the way I suggest people do, to look at it is, if you're talking about somebody who has spoke about the gospel of salvation, meaning the death, burial, and resurrection being the only way it works is not, the, is not the way possible, it's only through Christ's blood, and then they get caught up in a sin, that's not evidence that they weren't ever saved. But there are many people, I think, that... that may not have been saved, but we can't, we can't see one example and let that explain all. And that's one of the dangers that we have with the things that John MacArthur and others teach when it comes and to that. And then just pertaining to that same passage, um, are teachers held to a higher uh, you know, level or higher responsibility? Yep. Yes. Um, um, Paul? That, and if they're preaching the wrong or teaching the wrong, mm -hmm. well, you know where I'm going with that. Sure. Because that, that causes so many problems. Being a stumbling block to others is, is a huge, huge problem, which is why I emphasize that, that, that we got to be really, really careful, and teachers have to be really, really careful. And I think there's a lot of people out there teaching who have no business teaching. A lot of people teaching who have no business teaching. They need to still be learning. Um, first, uh, Alec, and then one of you two. Is it kind of this whole repentance thing, like I need to repent in order to maintain my salvation? Just inquisitive nature. I think I, I, I ask why. You know, like I'm looking at myself and examining, well, you know, if you really, I'm doubting um, your salvation based on that. I guess, really, if you, yeah, if you put it right to that, I, I don't I guess I don't think of it in terms of that because I don't believe I, yeah, I don't know. I have to rethink, uh, you know, what we Because, I, I mean, repentance does not secure your salvation. It's the death, burial, and resurrection right, of Christ. Right. Repentance may come along with it. You might want to, you know, repent as well to turn away from things that were sinful. But there's still a, a sin or two in your life that you're constantly going to be fighting in this flesh as a but, believer in Christ. But you're constantly doesn't Paul talk about like um, going to be going back like evidence forth. of our, you know, our good works through Christ Jesus as a correspondence. Put the you got to put the, the stuff in the right order, okay. like anything else. <clears throat> If you start from the very beginning, the very beginning of this is Ephesians 1.13. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed, you were sealed. It's Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians 4.30, you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Paul talks about those who, who believed in vain. In other words, you didn't really believe that, is, he talks about. That's between you and God. That's why I don't get into questions whether somebody's saved or not, is because... I can tell them the truth. I can ask them, do you believe this? Yes, I believe that. Then I assume you're saved. Guess what? You're, you're invited to take communion with us. That, that's fine. I don't suggest people ever doubt it. Now, Paul does talk over and over again about those who, who either continue in sin. Though, I mean, the Corinthians, you had the guy who was sleeping with his mother-in-law. He says, put him out. He doesn't question his salvation at all. He never questions his salvation. And so understanding that we're created unto good works, Ephesians 2 says uh, we are his workmanship. And so all of those things, but the idea of, 
of doubting our salvation. I, I, I really think that that is, is, is something that we, we don't want to get into because then I think that we fail. We want to apply that so often. Uh, again, well, that person must not have been saved at all. And then we almost can blow them off. No. May, that they're probably a brother or a sister who, who, who may, need, may need some truth and may, may need some guidance or may need a swift swift little hand in the, in the rear reminding them, wait a minute, just you, you know who you are in Christ. And so we got to be careful when it comes to all of that stuff. And, and this is why, again, when Paul talks about it, but then again, so many people have been um, um, thought, made to think things like you see in the Gospels, which I want to turn to in a minute, but I promise Valerie and then uh, Reg, and then I know uh, uh, Alec has his hand up. One thing that you brought up, that's what I was thinking of the, the guy in First Corinthians. But in addition to that, just in, in our walk, I think so many people stumble, and, you know, because so many te- churches, you know, have taught people this, this very rigid, um, legalistic, you know, approach. The law couldn't, I mean, nobody was able, even, even the nation of Israel, um, God knew they couldn't keep it. He gave them an out, right? You bring your you bring your sacrifices to the altar. You do your yearly one. But they still were chasing after false gods and everything else. And um, mm-hmm. when we try to put ourselves under a yoke of, of constantly doing that, we don't succeed. We're under grace. And when we continue to take ourselves back to the cross and see who we are and see who we are in Christ, um, that love and that um, truth of who we are in Christ generally overpowers you to do to walk in the spirit versus in the flesh and I think that you know that's way more powerful than the other way around yeah that's what most people learn which when you go to the gospels that's where most churches are preach out of today is you know, do this don't do that which we're going to look at here in a minute so you're exactly right Reg well uh, to kind of what I found my answer to what you were thinking is that uh, in I think it's Corinthians Paul talks about the saints that are doing stuff wrong and mm-hmm. continue to do he says for that reason some of you were sick it's and first Corinthians 13 another reason, uh, he goes on to say and they paraphrase in here that if you don't for that reason some of you were sick mm-hmm. they died because God will punish you, not punish, but he will chastise his own. He, he doesn't put you on a real short leash, leash, but if you continue, 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 you can look for some correction. Yeah, well, he'll actually turn you over to your, that's, um, I forget what it is, but, that, mm-hmm. you know, uh, he'll turn you over to you, the, the desires of your heart. Yeah, well, yeah, like yeah. the Corinthians. That's yeah, Romans that 1 that talks about that, yeah. yeah. But yeah, and keep in mind, I, I, it, is, it is the idea for us to question salvation. But um, just remember what you've believed. And, and I didn't even really think of it that deep. Yeah. I wasn't questioning it, honestly. Sure. But yeah. now it, you meant the way that you said it, that's true, that I guess I was. And uh, volunteer. Right. So, mm-hmm. Alec, Alex, do you have something? Um, and while he's t- saying, turn to Matthew. Book of Matthew. I would imagine all do. He he acknowledged, like I said, that, and he's he the the context seems to be after he's been saved and after he's been, you know, doing his work of his apostle that I do the things that I shouldn't and I don't do the things that I should. Um, now we don't know the the different things, but I I think we all can relate that life is a struggle. We live in a world that's fallen. There's temptations that are um, that are that are there, and and, and so. I think one of the most important things for that Paul continues to remind people, and this is what I try to, to try to emulate, is know who you are in Christ. And this kind of piggybacks off of what Valerie's talking about too. When you know who you are in Christ, when you know the power of the resurrection, when you it's when you walk in the spirit and the newness of life of who you are in Christ, that is what's able to get you to overcome the the the, the, the flesh. 
But if you don't do that, and you and, and there are those out there, and, and as a, a, if we get into the idea of questioning salvation, then it's kind of like, who here likes sports? Okay, if you like sports. You ever seen where, you, you know, this happens to me. I get frustrated sometimes, don't I? You know, I think of like the St. Louis Cardinals or the St. Louis Blues, and I hear them, they'll be on a losing streak, and I'll hear the announcers talk about, you know, oh, well, they're having this issue, and I'm like, no, that's not what the issue is. I know because I'm an expert, right? So, you know. <laughs> but my point is, is I'm like, no, that's not. And if you look at the wrong issue, then you're not going to address the real issue. And so that's why it's important. Don't, don't address the salvation issue. Now, Identification. yeah, if you understand who you are in Christ, then you're able to fix these issues. Um, that's the important thing. But again, that's... We're talking about somebody. Now, if you've got somebody who is part of a denomination that teaches the false gospel, then I'm not necessarily going to assume that, they've, that they're saved. Uh, I'm talking about those who, who, who are attending a good Bible-believing church and have put their faith and trust. Alan. Um, just two quick things. One, what happened to that guy anyway in Corinthians who was having an affair with his mother? He repented and he was brought back into the church. So he did repent and got back in. He acknowledged what he was doing was wrong, and uh, they, Paul instructed them to let him back into the church. So and then instructed, this is key, and then he instructed the other people, don't think so high on yourself because you could fall into the same trap. Like humbling the teachers of that church. Okay. Yeah. And my very last little point here is I would love for, at some point for you to clarify this of other churches preaching legalism out of the Gospels and saying, oh, you can't do this or do that. <coughs> Well, I'm getting ready to preach one right now. <laughs> um, going back to the gentleman in uh, Corinthians, it, Paul tells them to cast such one out. That is, cast such one out uh, so that Satan can destroy his flesh, mm -hmm. but his soul, soul shall, shall be, be saved. saved. Yep. Yep. Signifying the idea that his, you know, he, he's not going to lose Sebastian. Look at, uh, turn to Matthew with me. Matthew chapter 18. Here, again, we see a situation where you have conditional salvation. This is the kind of stuff that you have to understand that the Gospels teach. Matthew, when I say the Gospel, I mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, this is why you see things in there. They'll know you by your fruits. Well, yes, people are going to know us by our fruits, too, most of the time. That's true. <laughs> But that's not the context that Jesus is talking about. This is why you'll see James later saying that those who say that they, they know Christ and they don't do his commandments, they're a liar. Paul doesn't say that kind of stuff, and it's for a reason. It's because of things like this. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Uh, let's see, where do I want to start? Um, let's start in verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often should, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say unto thee, unto seventy times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And he gives this, this, this situation here about forgiveness. Now skip on down towards the end. Look at verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother that trespasses. What he's talking about here is, is the idea, if you don't forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. See, that's not something that is meant to have some great, you know, motivational speaker try to twist this and turn this into some idea, some great message about how you should forgive other people. No, this is a specific thing when it, when it comes to the kingdom. It was told to them, if you don't forgive, your father won't forgive you. And this was an expectation. What's that? The Lord's Prayer. Right. And what they call the Lord's Prayer. That's the kingdom age prayer. Yes. And for and Christians. Right. And so we have to understand that when it comes to um, rightly dividing between the scriptures that the things that are told here much like the things back back here in, in in Genesis we're talking about they're not pertained to us that doesn't mean there aren't things that we can't learn from it I think it's very clear from here that God wants us to forgive 
We can certainly take that from it. But we can't take away from this scripture just because we want to try to make it sound good for us today. And that's the problem that's going on in the world is people want to water this down. Alan. Well, I remember you once said that, you know, it's, it's unwise or even dangerous to spiritualize the text because mm -hmm. of taking it out of context. And so that was my question about the legalism that a lot of churches are preaching in the Gospels here. These Gospels, if I'm correct, were meant for the nation of Israel at the time that Jesus came to preach them and to lead them into the kingdom mm -hmm. gospel. But the Pauline epistles is where we should be looking at today, Acts to Revelation, because that's the gospel of salvation. Yes, Acts to Philemon, yes. Revelation, um, again, won't pertain to you. So, Revelation is after those, after the rapture. So, Make sense? So then it would be Acts to... Philemon. Really, Romans to Philemon is really most of your, is your writings. Philemon. Yes. Yeah. First, the Peter, Peter's and James and John's um, later epistles, those are to the, the tribes of Israel. And then the book of Revelation is also to the nation of Israel. And anybody can pick it up during the tribulation, but you won't be there. So unless you, as Paul likes to say it, believed in vain. So as long as you believe the gospel of your salvation, you're not going to be here for the tribulation. So. Genesis 35 again. And so, um, again, understanding that... Um, Believing out of emptiness. Vain has to do with an emptiness. In other words, you know, if I told you the gospel of salvation and you just shook your head, yep, but you didn't actually believe, or if you even said I believed and you didn't really believe, you know. My dad, when, when I was a kid, the pre this is when people used to come knocking on your door, and I can, I can tell you half a dozen times they knocked on our door, and he'd sit there and he'd shake his head and say, yeah, and he'd even get down and pray with them, and then after he, they left, he would... Yeah, yeah, I just did that to get them out of here. You know, so that would be in vain. But understanding, nobody can know if you believed in vain except for you and God. Okay, yeah, that, I was just going to say that's the part where you mentioned earlier. Yeah. About it between yourself. That's between you and God. If somebody tells me that they yeah, believe, then I. Judge. Yeah. Don't judge. That's right. I, I take them. Now, if they tell me they're a believer, <laughs> then I, I would judge matters of them based upon them being a believer. I assume that they're a believer. But the other thing is, is I would be careful about, well, did I, did I, maybe I didn't really believe, did I believe in vain? I don't think it's that complicated. Okay. I, I think it's as simple as, did you believe, did you put your faith in the finished work of Christ for your salvation? If you did, at that moment, you're transferred. You can't retroactively say, nope, I want to take that back. So... It's at that moment you're bought with a price. And so um, you mentioned Johnny Mac and words, his words at one time he said that really stuck with me was if we could lose our salvation, we would. I would have by now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, and I, I think John MacArthur does a fantastic job. Now, again, do I disagree with him on this? Yes. Do I think that it's very problematic? Yes. Uh, do I think he's much smarter than I? Yes. Uh, all of those types of things, but the fact of the matter is, is he will take that next step and say, "Well, they must not have been saved because they're doing this." Whereas I, that's not a, that's not biblical, in my opinion. I don't I don't I don't think that that's right. Uh, but um, that's not uh, for me to judge. So, Genesis thirty-five, back there. Well, that was a fun conversation. Genesis thirty-five, and so. Verse 5, and they journeyed. God puts the terror of God on them. Verse 6, so Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel. He and all the people that were with him, and he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. And so, again, El Bethel would be God of the house of God. Uh, and Verse 8, when Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried with, beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of that name of it was called Alan Bakuth, uh, which uh, we're told, and assuming that it's the case, we're told that that means that Alan Bakuth means the oak of weeping. 
and so she was buried there. Apparently, I guess, um, Jacob was very close to her. She was probably a nurse to him. Verse 9, And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padanaram and blessed him. Now, the word I want you to take note out of that verse there is appeared, okay? And the word again. And so here, be reminded that the, the scriptures, according to the scriptures here, God literally appeared unto Jacob again. So a second time, it was a manifestation of God. He appears unto him. God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. Notice that how it has the, the God's name in it, El. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Um, here you have the, the name El Shaddai, um, which... Uh, as one of those names of God. Be fruitful and multiply, he says. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Which this is kind of interesting. Um, remember, his name was changed, changed back in chapter 32 whenever he wrestled with God. That's whenever he was, uh, his name was changed. Um, but the other thing to take note of here is where it says, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, we haven't seen that for a while, have we? Because actually, uh, when it was Abraham and it was Isaac, it was God saying, I will multiply your seed. I will do it. But now we hear see, now we see um, for the first time since Noah, the, the, the instruction, you go be fruitful and multiply. We saw it with Adam and Eve. We saw it with Noah. And now we're seeing it here with Jacob. And so you see that, you know, Jacob, Jacob has his 12 sons. God did bless and he, he, he did fulfill the blessings as it related to um, uh, bringing about the sons. Um, now those sons are born. And here we have a command for Israel in a national sense now, really, for one of the first times. To be fruitful and multiply. Because remember, there was the idea of you're going to be more than the stars of heaven. You're going to be more than the sands of the sea. But now we have this instruction here that uh, you need to go be fruitful and multiply. I know back in the garden, if that was the case, or even with Noah, uh, you know, this wasn't a, hey, it'd be a good idea kind of a thing. This was an instruction that, that they needed to follow. And so many people think that, you know, when it came to um, the Garden of Eden, there was really one and only one instruction, when in fact there was two, wasn't there? Don't eat of the tree and be fruitful and multiply. And so, you know, even if they hadn't eaten of the tree, but if they weren't fruitful and, and didn't multiply, that, that, that would have been a sin. That would have been wrong because they were commanded to do so. And so uh, I'm not saying that that was necessarily that level here. I don't know. But I do know that here we have uh, a different wording from God. And now there's this expectation, almost like I've brought you this far. Not saying I'm done with you or anything like that. I'm not suggesting he's done with him. But it's almost like he's brought him thus far. Now you need to go and you need to be fruitful and you need to multiply. And so that to me is, is something that I, I thought was, was quite interesting. Um, and and I, we, I won't take you to all the scripture references before, where God says, I'm going to multiply you to Adam, uh, or sorry, to Abraham and to Isaac. But I, I've got those wrote, wrote down if you'd like to get those from me later. So, Isn't it funny, too, that it's El Shaddai there? Because isn't that God all bountiful? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. He's telling them to be fruitful and multiply, but he's going to... Yep. And the other thing that's interesting from this verse is where it says, kings shall come out of thy loins. This is the first mention of that aspect of it since um, Genesis 17. I'm going to go back there. Genesis 17, verse 6. That's whenever God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Verse 5, his name is changed. In verse 6, I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will... Make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Uh, and I think there's another verse, verse 16, and I will bless her. This is regarding Sarah. Uh, Give thee a son also of her. Yes, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And so here we see for the first time in a while this aspect of that, uh, that blessing being uh, re-mentioned. Verse 12. 
And land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee, I will give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. Again, I, I, I mentioned that the way I did because, again, the scripture indicates that this isn't a vision, this isn't a dream, this is an occasion uh, where, where Jacob was visited. So, Alec. I'm oh, sorry, we're in Genesis 17? 35. We went back to Genesis oh, okay, 35 again. Okay. And so I think what we have here is the um, presence of God that, that came and spoke with him. Verse 14, and Jacob set up a pillar in, this, in the place where he had talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. Uh, here we have the first mention in Scripture of a drink offering. First time we have this. Uh, later in Levit Leviticus, under the law, a drink offering becomes something that God institutes under the law. A drink offering was wine, typically. It would have been wine that was offered um, for it. Um, the idea of a drink offering is, is, is signaling a pouring out of one's life is, is what a drink offering is. It's signifying that you're going to pour out one's life. And you, and you hear these, these type of words as it relates to Jesus and how he poured out his life for us. And so um, here again we see this and again, I think the reason why you see this is because this is where, where Jacob is committing himself to the God of his fathers um, as his God, really, for the first time. Because remember, it was, all right, I'm leaving. Yep, God, if you do these things that you say, you'll be my God. And he goes up for 20 some odd years, comes back down, um, and, and then he's told to get over to the place where you made the vow by God. And here he's making... He's, he's where, he, where he made the vow that he would be his God. He's cleaning things up. He's getting rid of the, the idols and, and all of that stuff. And he's, he's making, these alt, making this altar. And, and what we see here with this drink offering is, is, is the idea here is Jacob is, is declaring that he's going to pour out the rest of his life to El, to God, um, to El Shaddai, to God Almighty is, is what, he's, what he's really doing. Look at Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15. Here we see uh, chapter 15, verse 5. Here we see verses 5 through 7. We see this drink offering talked about and says starting in verse 4 then shall he that offereth his offering on the Lord bring a meat offering of a tenth a uh, deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of him and a hint of oil and the fourth part of a hint of wine for a drink offering shall thou prepare with the burnt offering or sacrifice for one lamb verse 7 and for a drink offering thou shalt offer the third part of a hint of wine for a sweet savor unto the Lord and so we, we see that typically the drink offering would have been would have been wine, and along with it, you would have anointing of oil and that type of stuff that were, were taking place. And so, again, it really just signifies the idea of somebody pouring out their life. Um, that uh, is what they're what they're trying to show there. Back to Genesis 35. See if we can't get a little further. And Jacob called the name of that place, verse 15, where God spoke with him, Bethel. Verse 16, and they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Hard labor. Ephrath is Bethlehem. And you can go to Micah, uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and compare that to Matthew 2, and you see it referred to as Ephrathath, uh, Bethlehem. And so um, whenever he's traveling from Bethel to um, Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. That is the place where Jesus will one day be born. That is the place where David will one day uh, come from. And this is the place in which Rachel will end up dying as she gives birth to, um, to Benjamin. And we won't go there. We don't really have time. But you might remember the story in which it talks about 
uh, whenever uh, Jesus is born and Herod goes about to kill all the, all the babies that were born and you have the slaughter of the innocents, what event does it say that that refers to? This time here with, um, with, the, death, with the death of, of, of Rachel and, so, um, and her crying. And so it's interesting when you compare those, compare those two. So verse 17, And it came to pass when she was hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. Uh, in other words, you can see here the, the concern on, on her part was for the child. And that's where her concern was. It's not, the midwife doesn't say that you're <coughs> going to survive, but it says you're going to have this child. Verse 18, here we have a very interesting verse. I um, wish we had more time to really look at it. But if we need to, we'll do, do some more next week. And it says, And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benani. But his father called him Benjamin. Here you have the Bible giving you a definition of death. Death is when the soul leaves the body. That's what the idea here is, is that whenever her soul left his body, or left her body, that was, that was her death. The soul didn't die, but the body died. And so here what we see is what, what the body, or what, uh, what this is talking about. Um, she, she wants to call him Benani, Benoni, however you pronounce it, which means son of my sorrow, but, um, Jacob not willing to look at his son in that sense and probably think of him in that sense. He decides to name him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand, uh, which is a place of honor. Benjamin receives a place of honor. It's Rachel. Remember, Rachel only has two sons, two of the pr most real prominent ones of Jacob's sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Um, you know, Joseph obviously is going to to have much to do with what's going to happen here shortly as they go into the land of Egypt. Benjamin is going to be the line in which uh, the Messiah is going to come from. And so not that the other ones aren't going to have a, a, a big part too, especially Judah, but, um, but, but Benjamin is going to, um, you know, where, where, where Jesus was born at there in, in Bethlehem. So we'll have to stop there. Any questions? Okay, very good. We'll pick up in, um, we'll, we'll start in verse 18, or 18 uh, next, next week as well, in case we want to talk about that. But here, in just a couple of verses, we're going to talk about, like I said, Reuben and him losing his birthright and how that comes into play and how that affects, um, you know, Jesus comes from the line of the tribe of what? Judah. Judah. Well, it's very interesting because when you think of birthrights, the birthright should have gone to Reuben, but it didn't because Reuben did something very bad. And so Reuben loses that birthright because of what he does in just a few more verses here. So we'll talk about that next week.